Good day, my name is Monet Stander and I do thank you for tuning in today. The passage we will be discussing is Colossians 1 verse 1 to 14. Uh, if you have not done so already, I do encourage you to pause the video here and to do a short prayer at the Lord to prepare your heart for this message today. Until recently, I worked as a missionary across uh, Southern Africa. During my time in ministry, I met quite a few missionaries that work right around the globe, from the Amazon in South America, to the tribes in Papua New Guinea, to the mountains in South Sudan. Some of these people I may never meet again in, in this life, but yet I have the desire to continue praying for them and also those that have come to faith because of their ministry. Yet I sometimes wonder what my prayer should entail uh, for these people. We find Paul giving, giving us an example in Colossians 1, and as the title of today's sermon is What to Pray for Fellow Believers. Now we of course believe the Bible to be, still re to be relevant to us today and to be God's word for us, but one must always remember that it was written for a specific group or specific purpose, um, whether it be individuals or churches. We thus always have to read the Bible in context and to see the, the, the context the original writer intended it to be, his original message and the argument he wanted to convey to his original readers. From this, one can derive the importance and application for us today. Now, the background of the letter of, uh, to the Colossians is that Paul is the author and he writes this to the church in Colossae. Colossae was a small town in what will be today will be modern Turkey. And it was a mixture of native Phrygians, Greeks and Jews. Um, Paul had never been to Colossae, as we read in Colossians 2 verse 1. Um, and he writes to them because of matters raised by Epaphras, which came to him when Paul was, was still in, in prison in Rome. And he came with a few matters that he, what he needed to, um, uh, Paul to address uh, with the church in Colossae. Now the trouble in this community was the tendency to in introduce ideas from other philosophies and religions on a level with Christian truth, uh, much like we see in today's culture. From the Jewish side, you had the teaching that you first had to be circumcised, first had to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And then after this as well, that you had to uh, continue upholding the Jewish traditions and the Jewish law. From the Greek side, the Gnosticism, which taught that you had to obtain a special knowledge uh, to, in order to be um, reconciled with God. And that the, all matter, all physical uh, matter is evil and the spiritual is pure. Thus, this led to a teaching that you can continue sinning, continue living a life in sin, because it's only your body, it's only the physical part that's sinning, but your spirit remains pure. Uh, we find in, in um, 1 John 1, where John counters this idea of Gnosticism, where it says, but if you say you have fellowship with God, yet live in darkness, the truth is not in you. Now, Paul has rights to address these false teachings, and to encourage a community that one must remember he has never met. Now, given this context, we turn to our passage for today. I'll be reading from the ESV translation, and please read with me as I read from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, and for all endurance with patience, and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, 
in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Still there. Now let's just quickly regather our breath. It is sometimes difficult to read Paul's passages, uh, as he liked to write this at the time, use very long sentences which contain so much information. It is thus ben beneficial to divide this, this, pas this passage into smaller sections. Uh, by looking at a verse or two at a time, it is much easier to grasp the passage intended message. When doing so, we see that Paul opened this letter uh, in the usual form of a greeting in verse 1 and 2, a thanksgiving from verse 3 to 8, and a prayer uh, from verse 9 to 14. This introduction is perhaps a bit longer than usual um, because, it was not personally, because he was not personally acquainted with the people at Colossae as previously mentioned. The greeting in verse 1 and 2 follow the standard practice for writers of the time to start their letters with their own name and to follow this with a blessing. Paul also reminds his, his readers of his apostolic uh, position, which is not by his own decree, but by the will of God. Again, this is especially important as he has yet to meet uh, most of the original recipients of this letter. In a thanksgiving in verse 3 to 8, Paul thanks God while praying for the Colossians, as it is God who has produced the conversion with Christ the center thereof. He uses the terms faith, hope, and love to refute the Gnostic heresy of needing special knowledge to be reconciled with God. Faith, hope, and love are the three principal graces in the Christian life, and it's not necessarily what you know, but who you know and by whom you know, uh, as we read in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Knowledge is thus good, but only insofar it leads to an increase in faith, hope, and love. We read in verse 6 to 8 that after hearing the gospel, which has spread over the world by this time, that the church of Colossae were bearing the fruit thereof and also increasing in bearing the fruit of the gospel. We are to not merely accept or believe the gospel, but it must change us from the inside out. The gospel had reached Colossae through Epaphras, um, and it's believed that he came to repentance in Ephesus while Paul was there. From here, he went back to his hometown, to Colossae, to preach the gospel there, to plant the church. And from there, he's been serving the church at Colossae. In verse 9 to 14, we find Paul's prayer for the church in Colossae. One has to marvel at um, the accomplishment of this, of this person of Paul that uh, even in addition to his travels, his labors, his writings, uh, his toil for daily bread, that like he had time for such abundant prayers for, this, uh, for fellow believers. And his prayer includes four main points. They are one, that they may grow spiritually. This includes being filled with the knowledge of God's will and in all wisdom and understanding of his ways, as we read in verse 9 that his knowledge may lead them to, to glorifying God in good works and bearing fruit, as we read in verse 10, that they may be free, gloriously strengthened. Verse 11, the early church uh, faced many trials and tribulations and had many obstacles and enemies, and Paul knew that it would only be through God's strength, through his power, that they could endure these sufferings and also to endure them with patience and with joy. And four, giving thanks to the Father, verse 12 to 14. Firstly, giving thanks for them, that they've come to faith, that they've come to believe in Christ. And secondly, praying that they may give thanks to God. That even through the trials and tribulations of this world, that it is Christ that they, that is in Christ that they can now share in the inheritance of the saints, that they've been freed from Satan's power, that they are now part of his kingdom, and that in him their sins are forgiven. It is these four points that we find the answer to our question, what to pray for fellow believers. It's firstly that they may grow spiritually. This is a very important component of the Christian life. Those of you who are parents will know the importance of a baby growing. They are weighed every time you go to the doctor and we find delight in when there's growth uh, regarding weight or length. Why is this? If there is no growth, it would be a sign that there is something wrong. And so there is two, it's the same applies in, Christians, uh, in, in Christians spiritually. 
if we do not grow in the knowledge of God and His will and in discernment, it is a sign that there is something wrong. Secondly, we can pray that they glorify God. Jesus says in John 15 verse 8 that God is glorified and honored when we bear much fruit. The chief end of man is to glorify God. Sinners are to be the light in this world. Does that mean that we should take all the limelight? Just like the lights in an art gallery is specifically positioned so to magnify the beauty of the art, so we too have to live life that not takes the limelight to us, but it shines it on Christ and His beauty and makes His beauty known to the world. We must pray that their faith leads to good works and bearing fruit, which glorifies God. Thirdly, that they may be gloriously strengthened. Many fellow believers across the world live in dire situations and in, di in direct persecution. Most of us live in a country where we can freely obtain a Bible and even so in a translation that we desire. The, um, the most persecution we face is maybe being laughed at, maybe losing um, a few friends or, or, or family relationships. Yet many across the world live in societies where their livelihoods and even their lives are in danger for their belief in Christ Jesus. We must pray that they are gloriously strengthened by God, that as we read in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17, they too will count uh, the present sufferings as light moment momentary afflictions in light of the internal weight of glory that, is, that, that it is producing for them. And fourthly, we must give thanks for the Lord for these people. We are to thank God for those who minister far from their hometowns and the comforts of life given up. For those who in the midst of persecution still sings His praises. We are to thank God that He has saved us and still continues to save sinners right across this world. For what they... And we must pray, uh, sorry, that they, we must pray that they also remain thankful themselves. What they may lack uh, physically, materially, they have abundantly spiritually. We must pray that their focus will always remain on the unseen, on the future, on the life to come. For this view will always produce a thankful heart in the Christian. To conclude in Colossians 1 verse 1 to 14, we see Paul's loving care and continuous prayers extend beyond the churches he himself had planted. It um, reached uh, Christians that he had never met. Yet his prayers is centered on spiritual bless blessings, not on physical or material things. He prayed for spiritual insight, genuine ob obedience and moral excellence. We as believers, we may know the command to pray for fellow brothers and sisters, but what exactly we should pray sometimes eludes us, especially for ministries, for, for missionaries or the persecuted church across the world. Paul in this passage gives us a blueprint. While writing this letter, he had yet to meet the church of Coloss um, at Colossae, yet he faithfully prayed for them. He prayed firstly that they might grow spiritually, secondly that they might glorify God, thirdly that they will be gloriously strengthened, and fourthly that they give thanks um, to God. This is how we should be praying for our fellow believers, those we know and even those we do not know. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, No man can do me a truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. And where I conclude this, this, this video this morning, I do encourage everyone listening to take a few minutes at the very least and to pray for our fellow believers across the world, not only now but continuously going forward as well. Thank you.